I can start that up so it takes, it's there. And in the meantime, we will also try to do a bit of uh, look at the coursework and try to understand what's there in the coursework and what is expected out of it uh, as well. Let's just give a couple of minutes for if somebody else wants to join in to know more about the coursework for the CFD. Uh, I think you should be able to open it up and see. I think there's a Dropbox link. If you go to Blackboard, you should be able to see the link. And that should you should be you need to log in, but so you should be able to see a coursework.pdf file in there. But the other part I was looking at, uh, I don't know how many how many of you have seen this. So there's this uh, YouTube channel called Three Blue One Brown. So pretty nice channel. Like they look at like some of the math stuff and uh, try to really animate the thing. So like this, uh, as it says, animated math. Uh, I found it pretty fascinating and to understand uh, various very complicated topics. I leave the link to you. Like so, so for example, there's one on so what's the, what's like a partial differential equation, you know. And uh, I'll, I'll leave this guys leave this for you guys to look at it. Show up in many other parts of math and physics, like Brownian motion, the Black-Scholes equations from finance, and all sorts of diffusion. So there are many dividends to be had from a deep understanding of this one setup. In the last video, so it's always hard to understand what a partial differential equation is. So they really, really kind of make it very nice and uh, easy to understand, give a very nice geometrical perspective, not just to our partial differential equation, but there are a lot of things like from linear algebra to other things for those who might be interested to get a peek into into the is an equation that we actually can solve. In fact, if you've ever heard of Fourier series, you may be interested to know that this is the physical problem which Babyface Fourier over here was trying to solve when he stumbled across the corner of math that is now so replete with his name. We'll dig into Fourier series much more deeply in the next chapter, but I would like to give you at least a little hint of the beautiful connection which is to come. This animation you're seeing right now shows how lots of little rotating vectors, each rotating as... So think of Fourier series, it's just basically like circles that are connected to another circles. And depending on how big each of them are, you can pretty much get the shape of anything with a Fourier series. I mean, something, even I had not thought about that. The last one has some sort of pencil at its tip, tracing a path as it goes. For finitely many vectors, this tracing usually won't be a perfect replica of the target shape, which in this animation is a lowercase f, but the more circles you include, the closer it gets. What you're seeing now uses only 100 circles, and I think you'd agree that the deviations from the real shape are negligible. What's mind-blowing is that just by tweaking the initial size and angle of each vector, that gives you enough control to approximate any curve that you want. At first, this might seem like an idle curiosity. A neat art project, but little more. In fact, the math that makes this possible is the same as the math describing the physics of heat flow. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Step one is simply to build up the heat equation. And for that, let's start by being clear about what the function we're analyzing is exactly. We have a rod in one dimension, and we're thinking of it as sitting on an x-axis. So each point of that rod is labeled with a unique number, x. The temperature is some function of that position, t of x, shown here as a graph above it. But really, since the value changes over time, we should think of this function as having one more input, t, for time. You could, if you wanted, think of this input space as really being two-dimensional, representing space and time together, with the temperature being graphed as a surface above it, each slice across time showing you what that distribution looks like at any given moment. Or you could simply think of this graph of temperature changing with time. Both are equivalent. This surface is not to be confused with what I was showing earlier, the temperature graph of a two-dimensional body. Be mindful when you're studying equations like these of whether time is being represented with its own axis or if it's being represented with literal changes over time, say, in an animation. Last chapter, we looked at some systems where just a handful of numbers changed over time, like the angle and angular velocity of a pendulum, describing that change in the language of derivatives. But when we have an entire function changing with time, the mathematical tools become slightly more intricate. Because we're thinking of this temperature function with multiple dimensions to its input space, in this case one for space and one for time, there are multiple different rates of change at play. 
there's the derivative with respect to x, how rapidly the temperature changes as you move along the rod. You might think of this as the slope of our surface when you slice it parallel to the x-axis, or given a tiny step in the x-direction and the tiny change to temperature caused by it, this gives a ratio between the two. But there's also the rate at which a single point on the rod changes with time, what you might think of as the slope of the surface when you slice it in the other direction, parallel to the time axis. Each one of these derivatives tells only part of the story for how this temperature function changes, so we call them partial derivatives. To emphasize this point, the notation changes a little, replacing the letter D with a special curly D, sometimes called del. Personally, I think it's a little silly to change the notation for this, since it's essentially the same operation. I would rather see notation that emphasizes that the del T terms up in the numerators refer to different changes. One is a small change to temperature after a small change in time. The other is a small change to temperature after a small step in space. To reiterate a point I made in the calculus series, I do think it's healthy to initially read derivatives like this as a literal ratio between a small change to the function's output and the small change to the input that caused it. Just keep in mind that what this notation is meant to encode is the limit of that ratio for smaller and smaller nudges to the input, rather than a specific value of the ratio for a finitely small nudge. This goes for partial derivatives just as much as it does for ordinary derivatives. The heat equation is written in terms of these partial derivatives. It tells us that the way this function changes with respect to time depends on how it changes with respect to space. More specifically, it's proportional to the second partial derivative with respect to x. At a high level, the intuition is that at points where the temperature distribution curves, it tends to change more quickly in the direction of that curvature. Since a rule like this is written using partial derivatives, we call it a partial differential equation. This has the funny result that to an outsider, the name sounds like a tamer version of ordinary differential equations, when quite to the contrary, partial differential equations tend to tell a much richer story than ODEs, and are much harder to solve in general. The general heat equation applies to bodies in any number of dimensions, which would mean more inputs to our temperature function, but it'll be easiest for us to stay focused on the one-dimensional case of a rod. As it is, graphing this in a way which gives time its own axis already pushes our visuals into the third dimension. So, I threw out this equation, but where does this come from? How could you think up something like this yourself? Well, for that, let's simplify things by describing a discrete version of the setup, where you have only finitely many points x in a row. This is sort of like working in a pixelated universe, where instead of having a continuum of temperatures, we have a finite set of separate values. The intuition here is simple. For a particular point, if its two neighbors on either side are on average hotter than it is, it will heat up. If they're cooler on average, it'll cool down. Here, specifically focus on these three neighboring points, x1, x2, and x3, with corresponding temperatures t1, t2, and t3. What we want to compare is the average of t1 and t3 with the value of t2. When this difference is greater than zero, T2 will tend to heat up. And the bigger the difference, the faster it heats up. Likewise, if it's negative, T2 will tend to cool down at a rate proportional to that difference. More formally, we write that the derivative of T2 with respect to time is proportional to the difference between this average value of its neighbors and its own value. Alpha here is simply a proportionality constant. To write this in a way which will ultimately explain the second derivative in the heat equation, let me rearrange this right hand a bit in terms of the difference between t1 and t2 and the difference between t2 and t3. You can quickly check that these two are the same. The top has half of t1, and in the bottom there are two minus signs in front of the t1, so it's positive, and the half has been factored out. Likewise, both have half of t3. Then, on the bottom, we have a negative t2 that's effectively written twice. So when you take half of that, it's the same as the single negative t2 written up top. Like I said, the reason to rewrite it is that it takes us a step closer to the language of derivatives. In fact, let's go ahead and write these guys as delta t1 and delta t2. It's the same value on the right-hand side, but we're adding a new perspective to how to think about it. Instead of comparing the average of the neighbors to T2, 
we're thinking about the difference of the differences. Here, take a moment to gut check that this makes sense. If those two differences are the same, then the average of T1 and T3 is the same as T2. So T2 will not tend to change. If delta T2 is bigger than delta T1, meaning the difference of the differences is positive, notice how the average of T1 and T3 is bigger than T2. So T2 tends to increase. And on the flip side, if the difference of the differences is negative, which means delta T2 is smaller than delta T1, it corresponds to an average of these neighbors being less than T2. We could be especially compact with our notation and write this whole term, the difference between the differences, as delta delta T1. This is known in the lingo as a second difference. If it feels a little weird to think about, keep in mind, it's essentially a compact way of writing the idea of how much T2 differs from the average of its neighbors. It just has this extra factor of one half, is all. And that factor doesn't really matter, because either way, we're writing this equation in terms of some proportionality constant. The upshot is that the rate of change for the temperature of a point is proportional to the second difference around it. As we go from this finite context to the infinite continuous case, the analog of a second difference is the second derivative. Instead of looking at the difference between the temperature values at points some fixed distance apart, you instead consider what happens as you shrink the size of that step toward zero. And in calculus, instead of talking about absolute differences, which would also approach zero, you think in terms of the rate of change. In this case, what's the rate of change in temperature per unit distance? And remember, there are two separate rates of change at play. How does that temperature change as time progresses? And how does the temperature change as you move along the rod? The cool Okay, so I'll leave this link for you guys to have a look at it and I'll post it on Blackboard as well. So what I would just wanted to like just spend the first 10 minutes on is to just give a like a more intuitive feeling of what we mean by partial differential equations, what we mean by finite differences that we talked about in the last class and last couple of classes as well. We looked at a lot of these equations which you should have been introduced to in fluids one and fluids two, like the Navier-Stokes equation, the energy equation, the continuity equation, uh, which is not introduced for whatever reasons, uh, we'll not go into that, uh, but at least you have a general idea. So these are the three equations that we are solving, and when we are doing a simulation, when you go into ANSYS, press run, this is what is going to happen behind. So it's going to take those equations, put it into some kind of finite difference, finite volume form that we looked at last class, and eventually it's going to solve those set of equations. And uh, today we are going to try to solve them and uh, see how to how to set this up. But before we go ahead, I think uh, probably one thing that we want to also look at is the coursework, right? So, okay. So uh, if you go to Blackboard, you can probably see that the coursework, there's a link to the Dropbox folder. Similarly, for the labs I've, as well, I've changed things to put them into a Dropbox folder. So you can find a link for lab one and lab two, uh, rather than trying to upload them to Dropbox, because I want to upload ANSYS files and the solutions as well, which are going to be pretty heavy, and I don't want to put them on Dropbox. So you can just copy them from your OneDrive folder to your OneDrive folder, in a way. right? So similarly, the coursework is also available. I would suggest you to wait till the end of the day before you start downloading, and I don't think you'll start working today, but then if you do, if there's somebody who's enthusiastic about it, then please do uh, wait till the end of the day. But then I wanted to discuss that in class today, and hence I already uploaded the coursework. It's, the text would pretty much be the same. There's going to be more files and more, uh, let's say, supplementary materials for you to work with, okay? So the deadline for the coursework is 1st of May. Uh, in, in the finite element coursework, you are 15 days, and then you had a week's extension. I hope that was useful to you. Uh, we want to give the course CFD coursework much earlier so that you have a lot more time to ask questions. You have the Easter break to think about. You have more access to Fluent that way to uh, go, go to the cluster and uh, work with it. And also on the Blackboard, there's a link that allows you to download the software. So if you're going to download the software to your computer, please use the 2022 R1 version, not the 2023, uh, so that uh, the GTAs will be grading your coursework, are able to open it and see on the cluster. So they don't necessarily have it on their computers either, and they don't use, many of them don't use it, but then so they at least can use the cluster to make sure they're able to grade it, right? 
Okay, so one important thing, first thing is like the first of May is the deadline, so we almost have about a month and a half nearly uh, to work on this, so I think there's sufficient time to ask questions, sufficient time to work on this, to think about and uh, look at it. So most important thing, Blackboard is the only source of official information. Please don't go by my friend said this. Eventually, if you say that my friend said this, so I did this, that eventually will not count. Because if it's not there on Blackboard, it doesn't exist. Okay. So we want to make sure that it's consistent across the 500 students that are there in the cohort. So please note that if it's not on Blackboard, it's not there. So your friend said it. Then ask your friend to please share the link on the Blackboard or where it is on Blackboard if they said it, right? So we keep getting that quite a bit. And one important thing about a note on academic integrity, which I don't have to stress upon, is that uh, you should not be giving your solutions to the other person. Don't give your report to the other person. You are as guilty on the academic misconduct as much if you are giving it, as much as the person who is receiving it and writing it. So if you say tomorrow that I, I gave it to him to refer, but then he copied, he or she copied it and wrote, or they copied it and wrote it by from my report, and you are as much guilty because you shared it, right? So uh, most often students don't realize that, but then the work that is submitted should be your work. It, is, it should not be your friend's work. It should not be the work from the previous year. And most importantly, the coursework is completely different from what it was previous years. So till the previous year, it was like the same coursework repeated for 10 years almost. And so that's been changed now. So if you take a previous year's report, it's not going to be useful. I had a very interesting report last time. So there was one student. So the student took a plot from the report from one of the earlier years. And what that person did was essentially take a screenshot of it, open in paint, and change the color of the line from black to red, right? So that, that is okay, right? I mean, so that's, that's a foolish way of copying. Uh, and put it into the report. They wouldn't have got caught at that point. They even copied the caption, okay? And then it flagged the caption saying that, hey, there's the same thing from this particular report. And you see at the plot, you just zoom in, and even if you change the line color in paint, it'll have these pixels from the previous color, okay? So if you're even going to copy, you know, at least take the plot, Use a web plot digitizer, get the points, and plot it out by yourself. Then you probably won't get caught, right? So I'm just giving you a, you know, let's say a smarter way of copying if you want to copy it, right? So at the end of the day, all each of you have a different uh, geometry. So at the end, if you're going to copy, you'll definitely get a wrong result at the end of the day. So, so there are like 500 different geometries. So okay. So how do we grade it? Yeah, that, that's my problem. I'll think about that. So I've already thought about it. So each of you have a different geometry, you should be getting a different answer. So be careful when you're copying. I want to tell it to you right up front, but, but then still there'll be some people who will want to go ahead and copy it, and you're probably uh, making it easy for us to, you know, find that you're copied, right? I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to report anybody for copying, but so I, I'm kind of stressing on this point. Please don't copy from another's report because you will have a different result than what your neighbor or friend would have. And so please don't copy, right? And even if, if your friend is giving the report, then they're as much guilty as you are for copying. So you please don't share the report, write it by yourself, think about it. The problems are really easy. If you're coming to the lab and if you work out the lab thing, I don't think this is too difficult to do, okay? So if you just take the lab one, lab two, and lab three and work, it, work everything out by yourself once, that's all that's expected. Yeah? Sorry? Light on? OK. Is this better? OK. So I had some feedback that uh, people in the, you know, who are sitting a little bit behind can't see the screen because the light is too bright. So that's the reason I kept it a little low. OK, OK. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so I really want to stress on that to not copy. Don't take it from another's report. Please do it by yourself. All you need to do is lab one and two and three. Just work it out. Put your geometry instead of the lab geometry that's given in the lab, and I don't think you'll have a difficulty finishing this coursework very well. Okay, so what are our objectives for the coursework is to, we want to, eventually for the course and for the uh, assessment is to essentially see if you are able to understand the physics of the problem, are you able to simplify it, are you able to put it into a simulation tool and run it, you know, and uh, 
based on whatever result you get, are you able to make a critical analysis of that? Or, uh, write a paragraph about it and say why it is in a particular trend. That's all is expected out of this report. The report is really short. It's maximum of four pages, so please don't write more than that. There's an appendix of two pages more if you want to put in more figures and stuff. But please, please don't write more than that. I don't want you to write pages together. Okay? Yeah, but this is not a dissertation, right? So the problem here is very, very well defined. So when you're doing a dissertation, your problem is not well defined. You might or might not get a particular solution. So here the problem is very well defined. So there's a particular question, there's a particular answer always here. So for all of you, whatever is being given, you get a definite answer in a way. You get a, actually a particular value of an answer, to be honest. Okay, so the question is really, really well defined for each of you, so you don't have to write pages together. And if you look at the coursework description, I've written the pages together for you. Okay, so I've written like, so why are we doing this problem? So what is the motivation of doing this problem? So there's like about six, eight pages already I've written it for you. So please don't copy paste and send it back to me, right? Uh, which is I've already written it, I don't want to read it again. I already read it a couple of times and I don't want to read it more times. Right. So if I find it, if you copy it and send it back to me, it will be me reading my own writing 500 times. Really, I'm not interested in that. Right. So there are two parts of it. So one is to take, so both of it is just airfoil. So we are in this course, in this module this year, we are focusing on just one particular thing, airfoil. Right. So the idea here is for you to learn how to do a simulation, how to set it up, how to run, how to analyze. Right. So tomorrow you can take a different CAD geometry, put it in there and always be able to do it. Right. But as long as you understand what you're doing, you can change the CAD geometry, it's not a big deal to do that. So we're focusing only on one single thing, one single airfoil here, right? So your coursework is on airfoil, your lab is on airfoil, the next two lectures are on airfoil, okay? So very simple thing, very, very, very focused in that way. Okay, so there are two things. One is your part one where you take the same airfoil, run it on your ANSYS or ANSYS Fluent. If somebody wants to uh, use another software like, uh, let's say, Star CCM or Open Form or whatever, you're free and welcome to do that. But since in the class we are teaching ANSYS Fluent, in the lab we are teaching ANSYS Fluent, uh, most of you might be using that. So we expect that you'll be probably using ANSYS Fluent 2022 R1 version. Okay. So the second part is a MATLAB code that we'll do most of it in the class today and in the next class, where you you don't have to code anything, you just take the code, you just change the input parameters which are going to be well defined on the top of the code, you just run it for different parameters, it will automatically send out a plot, you just need to save the plot and you need to analyze what you are seeing in there. Okay? So then you don't have to code the MATLAB itself, we we'll look at it in the class, you just have to run the code many times. For those who are interested to understand the code, that I'll add in supplementary materials for you to understand how the code is working, what's happening in there. And eventually you can, compa you can compare the ANSYS results with your MATLAB results, you should nearly get the same thing, okay? So it's primarily marked on technical reporting quality. I don't care about the formatting, right? Now I've said this many times, I don't really care about the formatting. Just try to use a single, uh, uh, let's say, it's a single column format, it's easier to read, it's, uh, it also puts more, allows you to put more text in there. Apart from that, if you want to use a double column format, you're free to use that, just be consistent on all your headings, subheadings, sub subheadings, font colors and font sizes, so on through, throughout, uh, so it's just easier to read. But that's completely left to you, if you want to write your uh, report in Comic Sans, feel free. But you should not be writing a report in Comic Sans, but if you want to, feel free, right? Okay, so yeah, I'm not going to mark anything on your formatting. That's not, that's, that's not the assessment of this course. In this course, we are not teaching you how to format a report. I'm not going to assess you on that. Okay, so in part one, first thing is, there are two things that you'll be doing in both the parts. You'll be running one is mesh convergence. Take mesh at different sizes. See how the lift drag coefficients and the forces would vary as you change your mesh. Okay, so if ideally, uh, at the end of the document, there's also a Typical mesh convergence that's, that I have shown. So if, you, if we go down, I think, to last uh, few pages. Yeah. So the typical mesh convergence study. On the, on the x-axis, you have number of elements or number of cells here. And on the y-axis, you have like uh, some, uh, some value. Here we are going to look at lift and the drag coefficient, lift forces and drag forces. But this is just an idea of a typical mesh convergence study that's, that is done. Second thing that you need to do is 
Yeah, second look at uh, how your uh, ang how your lift and drag varies with angle of attack, right? So you have done a minus 10 or plus 10 and zero in the lab. So maybe if you want to take a few more or if you think three points are enough to make a plot and come up with a conclusion, feel free. Just change your angle of attack for your air foil and see how that would affect your lift and drag coefficient. I, as you see on a plane, as the angle of attack changes on the wing during air takeoff and during landing, they have their purposes. So the idea here is to understand what happens when the angle of attack changes, how does the flow physics change, right? And last thing is like, you know, what would happen if the free stream velocity changes, right? So here what I'm looking at is for you to see if you can make a point where you understand that something changes from laminar to turbulent, right? So I'll leave it to you for you guys to read. So there's like about eight, ten pages down here, analysis of a flow or an airfoil. The idea here is to give you the general background of what happens when there's a flow or an airfoil. And there can be several things that can happen. We generally, so what, what we are seeing here is more like a laminar flow. So if there's like a very nice uh, the streamlines are all parallel to each other. So there's uh, nothing complicated happening in here. But as the speed increases, as the free stream velocities increases, there can be separation. So when there's a suppression that can lead to a pressure drop, so simply to think about you know, on your airfoil, there's two different pressures on the top and bottom, and that is what is leading you to lift and drag. So now if this pressure starts to drop, that can lead to a stall in a way. So the aircraft is, doesn't have the lift, no, no longer has a lift in order to proceed ahead. And this is what happens when you have these kind of uh, vortices that are developing that is very near to the edge of the airfoil, right? And uh, there can also be like some uh, turbulent flow suppressions. And like, for example, there can also be like, uh, let's say, just, just some ideas for you to think about. And uh, there can also be like, like for example, people, for, the in, for example, simply in golf balls, you add these dimples so that one, one side is turbulent, one side is uh, uh, more laminar in a way, so that allows it to move far further ahead. So turbulence is not always bad, so generally you want to control where it changes from laminar to turbulent. So there's like a free stream, there's a separation happening, you want to control the separation point to be as far, as far away from the wing as possible in a way. So it's not necessary that laminar is good, turbulent is bad. Sometimes you want to maintain a turbulent layer rather than a laminar layer and move the separation point or further away from your airfoil. Right? So you want to read through it and for example there can be other things that can happen like separation bubbles. If you look at it, for example, a flow or a car, you can see that there's like a separation bubble developing here. Right? So because the air is flowing and then there's suddenly like some kind of a place where the, you can, vortices can be formed, so there's a separation bubbles that can form here. Same things, it can happen on the airfoil as well, and so on, right? So, there's also like, for example, in manufacturing, they also try to use guidelines so that you don't have these dead zones where there can be flow, the flow can start to create vortices and so on. Right? So, eventually what we want to understand is, the uh, entire idea here is to understand when things change from laminar to turbulent and can we control things changing from laminar to turbulent. So can we, so the whole idea, for example, in lots of uh, applications from automotive, aer aerospace, aerodynamics, all of these is to see can I, can I maintain a turbulent layer or can I maintain a laminar layer? Can it, can separation distance be further away so that we don't have to worry too much about uh, these transition regions in a way, right? So the whole idea is, for example, I've given you all these uh, discussion here just for you to think about it and to understand the physics, flow physics that's happening behind when we are solving for an airfoil. Uh, that, that would also help you to understand in the lab, if you have looked at it, we created a wake region in the first lab where we said we are going to refine the mesh here. So what is this wake region, right? So this is kind of what is expected in a critical discussion to, for you to understand the physics and to make an observation of what you are seeing in your simulations as such, okay? And last thing, the most important thing, like I always keep saying, is a mesh convergence study, because without a mesh convergence, we don't know if the grid you have chosen is right. So for each of these, you're going to basically, like somewhere like task to do, you're going to, like let's say, choose the software to use, like ANSYS Workbench 2021 or 22R1 is what's preferred, because that's what you're learning in the lab. But if somebody wants to use Star CCM or something else, please do let me know beforehand, before you submit your coursework. Second thing, there's a MATLAB code that can be obtained from the OneDrive folder. It's not there, it'll be put there uh, before the midnight so that uh, you can just run the code. There'll be a place where I'll show, say that, okay, this is where you change the inputs and you can easily run the code, change the inputs and run the code. Yeah. You said considering a small thickness, there's only one cell along the thickness. So there are. Oh. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but once you do a mesh convergence, you will eventually end up with like you know all this. All of you should get the same. I'm mean, not all of you. Each of you should get the same result. And, okay. Let me let me rephrase that. Irrespective, of, if as long as you have one cell in the thickness direction, doesn't matter what thickness you choose. You're doing a quasi 3D. It's like still a 2D case. You'll get the same results. If you're if you're if you're using a converged mesh. Right, so that's the reason I keep emphasizing that the mesh convergence is very important, because once you have a mesh that you can say is trustworthy, your results should reasonably be in the same bounds. Let's say, let's say I see the first couple of like, decimal digits outside. Okay. okay. So as you will see in lab two, I think some people were there today morning. Let's know if you will see through the week that uh, at least on your computers, if you have a student version, if you, don't, if you have a full version, I don't want to know how you got it, but then if you have a student version, then you, there's a limitation of 512,000 cells that you can use. You might think 512,000 is a half a million is quite big, but you'll realize that half a million is completely useless for CFD. You will not get even a mesh convergence with 512 if you're doing a 3D. So you'll want to do it something like what we call as a quasi 3D, and like you know, you have just one cell in the third dimension, which is what you'll be doing in the lab two. You can go to the lab two document if you want to look at, or you're coming back in the next week, Tuesday or Friday, uh, then you'll be looking at that and uh, building that up. So that's the kind of what's expected uh, to for you to do. You can do a 3D if you have a big enough computer. Uh, you can do still do a 3D. That's not. There's no problem with that. Yeah. Wait, there was a question. Okay, so that, that's a good question. So the question that was there, do softwares like OpenFoam possess such a limitation? So just for everybody's benefit, so OpenFoam is an open source software. So what's the difference between open source and ANSYS is open source, you have the so source code or the code which is used to run. In ANSYS you have an executable, but then you don't know what is happening behind it. In open form, it's like a, since it's an open source software, you have the core, so you can go into it and look at it and see what's happening inside the software. So what are they doing? When they're doing A plus B, you can see the code where the A plus B is being done, essentially. Right? So open form is open source software, so there's, it's free to use, so there are no limitations on that. But it's much, much harder to use than answers outside. Uh, you need to understand what you're doing before you start to play with open form. Uh, with answers, it's a little more easier because, as you will see in lab two, you will change your geometry a little bit, go and right click and say update, and automatically everything else, your mesh to everything will get updated. So same thing will happen once you solve a problem, again you can go and change your geometry, update, and everything automatically gets updated. So ANSYS Fluid is much, much more easier to use than open form. Yes, please. Sorry? I'm not able to hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah. On, on, on what? I still lost the last part of your sentence. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, good question. Okay, so the question was like, so I said that you need to do it on the university computer because it has more uh, power, processing power. Uh, not essentially, so you can use it on your laptop. So if you go to Blackboard, there's a link there where you can download ANSYS Workbench. But what would this will allow you to do is that there's also, by default, it goes to 2023 version. But you, there's also a link where you can download the 2022 version. So you can download the 2022 version on your laptop and use it. Still, it'll only be the student edition, which I, again still has the limitation of 512 cells. Uh, sorry, for no 512,000 cells. 512 cells is completely useless garbage. So it's still you can still only do a half a million cells. For a finite element problem, half a million is quite good. For a CFD problem, half a million in 3D is garbage, completely. So you can't do much stuff with five, uh, half a million cells in 3D. Uh, so that's the reason we want to reduce it to a 
quasi 3D or like you know one cell in a thickness direction or a 2D problem and still be able to get the equivalent results. So you can run it on your computer and if you don't have a computer, if you want to use the PC clusters, I think the software is only available on the uh, computer clusters in the building. I don't think they are available on the outside computers. I have not checked it but somebody might want to check it if you are planning to use that. So again like the bottleneck here is that the clusters are most of the time occupied with courses and stuff. So you might want to be able to use it when it's available to make sure that you have access to the software. That is the reason that coursework is really this early so that there's sufficient time for everyone to get access to the computers. But if you have your own laptop or computer with a reasonable RAM, let's say 8 or 16 GB RAM, I would probably say that you should probably try to at least install the software on your computer and be able to run it and see if it works and if you're able to do reasonable stuff with it. So I have a Windows laptop that has about 8 GB RAM, it seems to run reasonably on that. Uh, so I think that should be sufficient uh, as long as you have something like i5, uh, core i5 and then 8 GB RAM should reasonably be able to run. Yeah? Uh, if we have the 2023 Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would kindly ask you to get the 2022 R1 because the GTS will not be able to open it because the computer clusters only have a 2022 R1. Uh, so if I try to open a 2023 on the 2022, it says that it's from a future version and it can't open it. Yeah. Why, do, why do companies always do this sort of stuff? Sorry? Why do companies always do this sort of stuff? Why do they make it so the future versions aren't backwards compatible? Because they probably did not know they will release a future version. Huh? They, uh, they did not know what the future version will have maybe, you know. So there could be changes that are there in the future version which the previous version wouldn't know, right? I mean, as long as they have time travel or something and go back and tell themselves that this is what you'll have, then probably yes, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So the question was like, uh, with regard to the MATLAB, are we including the code in the report? No, the code is already given to you. There's only a top subsection of the input file where you'll change the numbers. So you probably want to report what numbers you're using so that we know what this plot means, but you don't need to include the code itself because the code was already given to you. So you, unless you're going to take an initiative to make changes in the code, make it better or something, then definitely be my guest. Please do include it so that the next time I can make it better, right? So otherwise, like, since the code is already there, so no point in including it. I don't want you to just upload too much stuff that is not needed. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So, so that's a pretty much there. So what you need to plot, so that it's very simple. One is the mesh convergence for a free screen velocity of 10 meters per second. So x-axis has a number of cells, y-axis it can be one plot, or if somebody wants to make four different plots, you can do it four different plots, uh, be my guest. Uh, so the lift coefficient on the y-axis, lift force on the y-axis, drag coefficient on the y-axis, drag force on the y-axis, and the x-axis has the number of cells. So that gives you a nice mesh convergence, ideally, your number should coins come, come to like some kind of horizontal line, either like from the top to a horizontal line or the bottom to a horizontal line. I mean, it need not exactly be a horizontal line, right? So as long as like reasonably the gradient is small, right? So as long as you're near a point where you can say, okay, the results are not changing much, right? So the whole idea of mesh convergence is if I change the mesh, will my results change? Or can I accept this as an acceptable result, right? So how do we know that the solution doesn't depend on the mesh? That's all we want to know. So the easiest way to do mesh convergence is probably just keep dividing your element size by half. Let's say if your element size was 1 to start with, next, next mesh can be half, next it can be 0 0.25, 0 0.125, and so on. And very soon you should probably reach a mesh convergence if you, if they, uh, if you have set everything up reasonably well, right? And uh, so the so second thing is you want to vary the angle of attack and see how that would affect your lift and drag coefficient, right? So for example, let's say for a particular angle of attack, there should be more drag than lift, and for a particular angle of attack, there should be more lift than drag. So that's how your air, air, aeroplane is operating, right? So that's how you're landing and taking off. So this, that, that's again like on the y-axis, on the x-axis you have the angle of attack. So I would say that in the lab you have done three points, you probably at least need three points, uh, but anything more than three points is definitely welcome, right? So you are, if you have just two points, it's always going to be a straight line. But then probably your angle of attack is not uh, 
you know, influencing this as like a straight linear behavior. At least you want three points where you, in the lab, you're doing plus 10, minus 10, and zero. So that gives you at least three points to create a curve. Probably more points always help, but more than three, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I'm not going to emphasize on that. Last thing is to look at, uh, let's say, what would happen in the... Uh, and last thing is, like, you want to talk about observed trends, right? So you plotted something with regard to like a particular free stream velocity, you and uh, let's say you looked at lift and drag, so how is this changing? Right? So we are, we are more interested in what's the trend rather than just the plot itself. So if you look at the grading rubrics, that should be somewhere on top as well. Yeah. So the grading rubric, so choosing the right software gives you 5%, right? So, so that makes your, the life of the GTS a little bit easier. So, and, uh, so if somebody is going to use anything other than ANSYS Fluent 2022 R1, like, like Star CCM or Open Foam or something, please let us know beforehand so that we know that you're going to use that, right? I don't want you to lose points for that. Second thing is choosing the right geometry. So each of you will have your own geometry and we'll make sure that you know that what your geometry is. And please use your own geometry, right? So that we know, if you, if you look at your answer, we know that you use your geometry, right? So if, if you've done a mesh convergence correctly, we, should, we would know what geometry you have used from that. So please don't take somebody else's geometry report file and just put it in there, because whatever you get in a next set of points, like three to eight, and you're just going to lose half of it if you're using somebody else's report. So essentially it's like you're taking somebody else's geometry, somebody else's results and report and putting it into your report and submitting it, then you're going to lose half of it, half of your points. And that's just, that is apart from getting, let's say, uh, reported. Right. So clearly state your boundary condition, initial condition. Sometimes just, you know, taking a pen and a paper and writing it, taking a photo on your iPhone or whatever phone you have and just putting it onto the, Word file is reasonably sufficient. I don't need you to write uh, pages together about what your boundary condition is. Even if you can draw a sketch and say, this is my inlet, this is my outlet, and this is the boundary, this is the velocity going in and going out, and this is a wall or whatever, right? And you can put an arrow and say, this is a wall, right? Solid wall. That is sufficient. You don't have to write pages together. I want to reduce your workload as much as possible. Focus more on the physics of the problem and, uh, and uh, mechanics rather than on uh, how, how to write paragraphs together, right? So last thing is uh, then the plots, right? So there's one plot of mesh convergence, lift and drag coefficient, lift and drag forces. So that's like, uh, let's say lift and drag coefficient is 5% across two softwares, right? So there's ba barely about 1.25 points per plot, okay? So the plot itself is not important to me, but what's important is let's say 20% goes into your critical discussion and using this idea of mesh convergence. So you want to do a mesh convergence, talk about why you are using a particular mesh and use that for the rest of your simulations with regard to change in angle of attack and other things, right? So that's kind of what we want to see. We want to, you to critically understand what you're doing and talk about it and write about it and use it. Right. So that is what you are learning in the course. That's what you should, we should be assessing your news. So that's, that's why it carries 20%. Plotting itself, anybody can do it. Give your data to somebody, anybody can plot it. But you as engineers are here to understand what's the meaning of this plot. Okay? So that's why it carries 20%. Same thing, for example, plot with variation of angle of attack. That's again like, you know, 1.25% or 1.25 points per plot. Right. So if you take it over the entire coursework, because this, well, this coursework is 50% of your grade, that's about 0 0.6 points on the entire module itself. You know? So the core plot itself is not important, but again, you know, the implications of what you're looking at, that's 20%. So that, that's the most important thing, your critical discussions and what you talk about it. Right. And uh, this is probably one well, last thing is one again looking at like lift and drag coefficient with increase in velocity, right? So you take a single angle of attack, increase your free stream velocities, and see how the lift and drag coefficient will change. So why should it change? Because you might start with like a one meter per second, which might be laminar, and as you increase your free stream velocity, there might be a transition point, there might be even a point where you're getting turbulence. But you're running a laminar simulations, but then you should actually be getting turbulence in there, which means that there's something wrong with your results, right? So there should be something terribly wrong at that point, and that's what you will see eventually when you try to solve the problem itself. Right? And then again, critical discussion, so that's 20%. Right? So, so you see, the critical discussion is about 60 points worth. And choosing the right software gives you 5 points, or 65. 
So the rest of the 35 is essentially gives you for your plots and stating your assumptions. So again, clear, like stating your assumption is five points. So just put a picture in there and you're done. You don't really have to go to any Photoshop or anything really to draw it out, see Inkscape or something. Just put a hand picture. I'm happy with it. Yeah. So critical discussion is, for example, let's take an, uh, uh, your angle of attack, right? So you're changing your angle of attack, yes. and you're plotting your lift. So your x-axis has angle of attack, y-axis has a, let's say, lift coefficient. Now let's assume there's a particular trend of how the lift coefficient is changing. Can you think about why it is changing that way? What is happening in there? What is the physics there behind it? Right? So, see, a bad example is saying that it is increasing till from, it's increasing from minus 10 to 0 and then decreasing to, from, again decreasing, right? So that's a bad, uh, that's not really a critical discussion. You've got a plot, I can say that's increasing and decreasing, right? So let's say it went this way, then if you say minus 10 to 0, it's increasing, and 0 to 10 is decreasing. That's not a critical insight, right? Yes, exactly. Example, like say, for example, as we, as we increase from minus 10 to zero, the less of the lift force produced by the airfoil's camber is canceled out by its downward tilt. Probably, yeah. So, so just, to, just to summarize the uh, question and answer here, so, so the question was, what, what, the, what do we mean by critical discussion, right? So critical discussion is something what you as engineer are providing in there. Right? If the plotter, let's say, has like a linear trend, for example, you know, anybody can see it and say it's varying in a linear manner. Right? What is the physical implication of this? What are the fluid mechanics behind that? What is happening in there? Right? So why is it increasing in a linear manner, or why is it decreasing after a particular value? Why is it increasing till a particular value and decreasing? We want you to answer the question of why. Right? So the, the other, this other motivation discussion that I've added here, like about eight pages of it, is kind of to give you the understanding of a bit understanding of the physics. I don't expect you to become an expert in turbulence in, let's say, in two days. People spend, let's say, decades on it and still don't understand turbulence. So I don't expect you to become an expert on turbulence. But at least are you able to relate what's, what you're seeing on the graph to what is actually happening in the physics, right? So that is what I mean by critically insight. So can you try to analyze the question of why? What is happening? I can say that. I can look at the graph and say it's increasing and then decreasing. What? I answered the question of what. Why is that happening? Right. So that is the question that we want you to talk about. Right. That, that, that is where you're relating your, quick, uh, your ideas of fluid mechanics and your modeling and simulation and all your other courses that you've done in mechanical and aerospace engineering so far. Right. So what's happening in there? That's the whole idea, to kind of understand your fluid mechanics and be able to depict it. That's kind of where you come as engineers. Okay? So that's the reason that's the most important part of the coursework. I mean, anybody can run a software, anybody can change numbers on a software, a monkey can do it if you train it enough. But then you're engineers and you, you need to do a little more than that. Right? So you need, anybody can say a graph is increasing and decreasing, but what is you as engineers bringing into the thing? Right? So that's kind of where I want you to think about why is the trend in a particular fashion and why do we, what, what, what does it mean for us, right? If you're designing an airfoil, in a, for example, you might be in an automotive company, you might be in an aerospace company, you might be in an aeronautics company, wherever you are, lots of these geometries have very nice thin airfoil shapes. It's a very, very common geometry used across the various domains. Even, for example, in heat transfer, you know, you use airfoil. So you want to understand what's happening in there. You want to understand and you understand the physics of it. Okay. Okay. So let's let's take a break at this point. I think uh, it's about uh, one fifty. We'll take a break for ten minutes now. And if there are any questions, and I'm happy to answer that. Once we are back, we'll try to look at the MATLAB and try to look at uh, the MATLAB code and what's happening in there and try to see how to take our finite differences that we learned in the last last class and try to put it and solve it with a computer. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them.
Right. That's a good question, right? I was, I was checking the... Uh,
Okay. Uh, hopefully we can get started. So if you go to the blackboard, on lecture three there's a small uh, PDF that says list of equations. I just wanted to have them rather than sit and write them here. But we'll tidy it up after the class and put up a nice, move, much nicer document for you guys to work with. Okay. So it is just a whole bunch of equations which presently mean nothing except scare some people away. Uh, but what we are trying to do today is we are trying to essentially see, so this was this is your NACA 23012. Tool. So for example, there's a website called airfoiltools.com, which is pretty nice. So you can look, at, look up for a lot of different airfoil profiles that are there and look at what the shape looks like, get the points of this airfoil, and play around with it quite a bit. And it also gives you the lift, I think, I, I remember seeing that it has somewhere that it also gave you the lift and drag coefficients, right? So for example, this is like, a, CL is like the lift coefficient, CD is the drag coefficients, CL versus alpha, alpha on the bottom is like basically your angle of attack versus the lift coefficients on the y-axis. So, and then again, like CD versus alpha is your drag coefficient on the y-axis versus your angle of attack. And, uh, I don't know what CM is, what they're plotting there, but I can find it out for you guys. So, yeah, so essentially if you look at different uh, uh, airfoils, so you can search for a whole bunch of airfoils in them. So there's like airfoil database search on the left side if you go to. So you can look for different types of airfoils. Like, so basically there's a four-digit airfoil, five-digit airfoil. So basically it's like NACA XXXX. So here's like five-digit airfoil, two, three, zero, one, two, five digits. So there can be four-digit airfoil, and each of them have a specific meaning. Right? So I, I leave this website for you guys to look at it and explore. I'll also uh, put it up into the document so that uh, you have the links for all of these uh, once the class is over. Yes, please. Sorry? Okay, so the question is like, uh, so in, the, in your lab you have the NACA 23012.igs file that you're using. So the question is how do I get .igs file, right? So, uh, so there are various different CAD formats that are there. For example, if you open, it, open up it in SolidWorks, the SolidWorks has its own native format called uh, SDLPRT or something, yes. which is basically purely owned by so SolidWorks. So basically all these files, essentially, if you are able to open them, for example, if you have a .stp file or .step file, you can open it up in a text editor. Right? You can open it in a text editor like your notepad or wordpad uh, and then have a look at it. So it basically it has like a whole bunch of numbers in there. So these are what are known as open source formats. And uh, so there are some formats that are closed source. For example, uh, if you take SDLPRT, which is the SOLIDWORKS format, we don't really know how they have encoded it. So essentially all of these is basically you have a CAD geometry, which means that you have a set of points and you have somehow connected these points and you have written these things into a file in a particular way. Right? So if we know how it's written, we can always let's say, reverse engineer it and read it out. SolidWorks doesn't let us know how they're writing it. Right? Because all of them have their own proprietary thing because they want to have a, let's say, an edge over the other competitors. So that's like a proprietary format. So there are several proprietary formats, and there's lots of open source formats as well. So if you open the, any CAD model in SolidWorks, you can always do save as, and save as .igs or .stp or any of these formats. So IGS is another, uh, uh, is another open source format. So you can take your file. If it's, uh, if it's not encoded, you should be able to right click on it and open it in Notepad or WordPad and look at the whole bunch of numbers in there. So these are open source formats where you, have, you can actually see what is there in that file. If it's a SOLIDWORKS file like SDLPRT, then if you right click and open it with a notepad, you'll probably see a whole bunch of garbage like, you know, like, like add, add, that's a whole bunch of, let's say, symbols and numerals which basically would not mean any sense. Because you can only open that with SOLIDWORKS applications or any application that knows how SOLIDWORKS can do. There are some applications where somebody might have developed an application, they would have bought an API or a license from SOLIDWORKS to say that we'll create an application that is able to read your SOLIDWORKS format. So they would have bought an API and SOLIDWORKS would have given them a code and said, okay, use this, our code as a black box. So every time somebody gives a SOLIDWORKS format, it goes through their black box and opens it up in a different format. 
Okay. So it's uh, IGS is an open source format that's being used uh, for our uh, lab, and I think you'll, uh, in the coursework you'll see there's another uh, open source format that we'll use called STP or STEP, which is called uh, STP file. So essentially, that's another open source format. So, so essentially, all of these are uh, all these open source format. Essentially, have all these points, and they basically say how these points are connected. And let's say if point one and point two is connected, what is the normal to that particular, uh, for, let's say, connection in a way? So generally, this, these are always mostly thought of in 3D. So you are connecting three points, which is called a, like a triangulation. You are creating a triangle, and then you say what is the normal of this triangle? So that's how these uh, all of these formats are uh, specified. That gives you the curvature in a way. So. So okay, that, that, that's how the, all of these formats are specified. So if you, if you go to this airfoil uh, database tools website, you can find a lot of airfoils. For example, the, you can download a .dat file. So if you look at it, this essentially gives you, if you take this in plot MATLAB and plot it as X and Y here, that should give you the shape that is being shown in there. Okay. So our goal for the next couple of classes is to see how we can take an airfoil shape that is available, put it into MATLAB, generate a grid, and solve the problem. And uh, eventually, if once you are able to solve the problem, then we want to compare how good the answers work with regard to our MATLAB. Since we have written the MATLAB code, since there are a lot of parameters that we can change, we can see how sensitive lots of things are with regard to the, your mesh convergence and getting a good results and so on. And you'll also see how bad answers fluent actually is in a way. Right? Okay. So, any questions so far? Okay, so that's a good question. So the question is like, are we going to be given IGS files or are we going to build them for, you mean for the coursework? So for the coursework, you're going to be given uh, STP files, which is very similar to an IGS file. STP. STP. So it's a STP format, which is another CAD format. So you can just as well, like just, just like how you imported your IGS file, you can import that into your answers as well. For your MATLAB, you'll be given a whole bunch of points, like how we are going to show in the class today, in order to generate your airfoil shape. And the idea of doing this is because I want you to go out and try out different airfoil shapes and see how the aerodynamics of different airfoils would differ from each other. I mean, especially if you go to the website particularly, you can see the whole bunch of data and, you know, you can get like for different, uh, uh, let's say, angle of attack, what should be the lift and drag coefficient. Now you can take your MATLAB code and try this out to, by yourself because uh, you have all the data of how to create the airfoil as well. Okay. So the whole idea here will going to give you points that basically make the shape, and from there you're going to build everything yourself. And on the answers, you basically have an STL file from which you basically run the simulation and see how they compare. Okay. Okay. If there are no questions, so I just opened a MATLAB window, so probably it could be helpful if you want to open a MATLAB window and, window and also code it, so that's a little more interactive in there, uh, rather than you're watching me code boringly on one side of the things, right? So I'm going to copy some code some, for some places, but uh, let's try to make it as much interactive as possible. Right? So our whole goal is we want to, let's say, take a, uh, let's say, NACA airfoil. For example, for this, we'll probably take a, like, a think of four-digit airfoils, uh, because they have a particular shape that's kind of easier to do with and we're going to try to build them up, right? So let's say, okay, probably maybe if I write that might help a bit. Let's see, let's keep that as well. Okay, so let's think of our airfoil as a, let's say we have a particular shape. So let's say we have, there may be a center line. No. So let's, let's assume that we have some kind of a origin, let's say zero comma zero. And we know there are different points on this, uh, cent on the center line, right? So we have known several points on the center line, let's say X1, X2, and so on. Okay, so our first goal would essentially, what our goal essentially would be to determine the profile of this. So if you're given a NACA airfoil, how do you determine the profile of that? So the first question is, 
we want to let's say a given an airfoil to determine the coordinates. We mesh the profile or airfoil and C solve for a probe solve. D get lift and drag coefficients. Okay. So that's our primary goal is basically we are given an airfoil, we want to find the lift and drag coefficients of that. We want to first start with a meshing, we create a mesh and then we build on that. Right? So sounds like a pretty boring job to do, but then gives you insight as to what's happening inside your ANSYS and uh, when ANSYS tries to, let's say you give a mesh and you get lots of errors and lots of warnings, most of the time you would not know what's happening in there. So the idea here is to essentially give you a little bit of an insight as to what's happening in there and try to build it from there. So when you go back, you go into your next year when you're trying to do your uh, individual projects, if you're doing a project related to CFD, either you'll be writing a, some kind of a code like this using an open source or using let's say, ANSYS Fluent, and in either of these cases, you really want to know how to use it and how to play with it. So that it's not necessarily that uh, you're just clicking a button and nothing's happening out there, right? So you're just getting warnings and errors, but you don't know what to do. So you want to try to understand what's happening in there, how to do, how to build with it, right? And also, if you guys don't know, you'll probably be told later in the, before the end of the semester that you can as well propose your own individual project, right? You can go and talk to somebody and tell that, hey, this is what I want to do as my individual project. And if somebody is ready to advise you, then I think you can always use that, okay? So you don't necessarily have to wait for somebody to give you a project, but you can always think of ideas from your own. So you can take some ideas from the CFD class, maybe go talk to somebody and see if you're interested in doing a CFD project, okay? Okay, so how do we, go about it, first thing. So the first thing is we want to build this airfoil, I said, right? So we are given a set of geometries, and then we want to build this airfoil. Okay, any, any ideas? How, how do I start from here? I am a little lost, it's pretty overwhelming, but, uh, but I think you guys should be able to cap get it. Okay. Okay, so let me just start by creating some kind of a function that would give me, so let's say if I know the x coordinates that I said earlier, and I know the thickness, I know the camber length and so on of the airfoil, let's say I know some, some information about this airfoil, I know about these red points, where they are, right? I know the maximum thickness maybe, and I know the chord length. So the idea what's the chord length? Okay, yeah, somebody's saying that, yeah. So it's the so length of the airfoil somehow. You already did this in the lab. Doctor? Yeah? Here's my shot in the dark. Sorry? Here's my shot in the dark. Sure. It's the distance between the leading edge and the trailing edge. Okay, okay, so one question was like, it's, somebody said uh, this, somebody said the leading edge to the trailing edge, pretty much meaning the same thing. Uh, yeah, a good, good. I thought the leading edge and the trailing edge were two opposites. Okay. Yeah, something to think about for us, right? So you know, I don't know what, what chord length is, I absolutely don't know, right? So then let's, let's keep it in mind, let's think about it before we come back to the next lab, because you're going to be doing airfoils for a while. So you want to know what, what's, the, what's the chord length, right? Because if you go to the airfoil website, you say chord length, but then you don't, you don't know what that is. I, mean, even I don't know what that is, so we should probably look for that. Right? So, they, they, you know, we know something like a chord length, we know the uh, x coordinates of each of the center line, we know the maximum thickness, so I'm going to assume that probably somewhere the maximum thickness is somewhere around here, just giving it a shot in the dark, right? So, and let's say this is our maximum thickness, I call it t, and I have my x coordinate and I have something like chord, chord length. 
So if you go back to our list of equations that we had in there, so I just put up a list of equations. We have something that relates our x coordinate to the chord length to the thickness. So that gives us the y coordinates or the positive y coordinates only for each of these points. So we know at, let's say at the top of the airfoil what would be the let's say y coordinate of this point. So let me just, just put it in there. I don't want to type it out, so I'm a little bit lazy. So I'm just going to copy that. So let's say let's call that. Uh, I think probably that this thickness. Yeah, so there's the one. So I'm going to take a function there and just put it into our MATLAB. I'm going to leave it there for a couple of seconds for you guys if somebody wants to type it out. Right. So basically, what I'm sending in is basically the x coordinate along my center line. So I have some chord length for this airfoil, which you can get from the airfoil website or any other, if you have any, any information for the airfoil, generally talks about chord length and maximum thickness. So if somebody is defining an airfoil for you, they're probably going to give you a chord length and a maximum thickness, most likely, right? So you want to know what that is, and we want to know how to convert that into some set of coordinates in there, right? So I'm going to send in my x, which is some input, which is the coordinates on the center line. I'm sending my chord length for this particular airfoil, and I'm getting some kind of, a, let's say, y coordinate on the top of the airfoil, right? So essentially, my y coordinate on the top of the airfoil will probably be somewhere along this, let's say, right? So I was, so far, maybe my airfoil is symmetric, in which case I can always mirror it. If it's not symmetric, then I'll have, probably have to do some other trick, right? So I'm going to start step by step. I'm going to say, OK, let me first find this out. And then let me find a second way to find the second one out. And then let me find out each of these particular points. right? Or I can as well download them from the Airfoil website as well and do it. So if I'm given a particular NACA X, X, Y, Z, T or something, right? Now the four-digit Airfoil, then probably each of these digits means something. And that means that I'm going to, I can use that in order to determine the profile of my airfoil. So once I know the profile of my airfoil, I can go to SOLIDWORKS as well, put these points in there, join them by a line, and create an STL file, or any kind of a CAD model, right? And you can use it in your simulation. So the whole idea, that's the reason I want to go over this, is because then, how do I create my own airfoil to work with, right? So if you go to this website, you can probably find out tons of them, tons of them, right? You know, so where are they? So if you go to the website, so there's a whole database search that you can do that will give you like, you know, a whole bunch of, for example, here there's airfoil A to Z, right, you know. So you can pretty much find a whole bunch of them, list of all airfoils as well, I guess. Okay? So a whole bunch of them. Okay, so it's not just the NACA airfoils. NACA is something that you might have heard of, but then there's a whole bunch of them that you can go. And most of them will give you these points. Now you can take these points and put it into a thing, or they'll probably say chord length of so-and-so and maximum thickness of so-and-so. Then how do I convert that into some form of a coordinate that I can put into my solid works and get a CAD model from there, right? Step one. OK. So put in some random code in here that basically I'm saying, trust me, that this is going to give you some the thickness at each of these x coordinates. So let me just save that. Okay. Yeah. And there's also available in your set of equations. So the equation one, yt, is basically nothing but the y coordinate at each of these x locations. Okay. So then, so I just want to make sure I, I am just doing the, copying the code as well here, just so that you I understand what these equations mean. So instead of giving you a cryptic set of equations, saying that okay, here's that does some magic in a way, right? So second, second step. So what's our second step from now on? So we got the top coordinates. So I'm going to just go back here and maybe in my main function, I probably need to call them, right? So to get the thickness. I'm going to get the thickness. OK. So if you look at it, so our user inputs. Yeah. I noticed there's one output and one input share names. Sorry? Yeah, okay. Okay, let's call this maybe YT, maybe. Thank you. Okay. How about that? 
Oh, that should work, I guess. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. And there should be some errors here. Unless somebody didn't notice. Right? So some of the errors that are there. Okay. So X is basically, let's say, a lin space, 0, comma C, comma, let's say, N. Oh my God. So we are basically I'm just putting some number in there, but we can that's for you to play with. So if there's a particular airfoil, how do I find the core length? How do I find the maximum thickness? And if I know the maximum thickness, then let's say, or let's call this T max. Right? So I'm just trying to put all our user inputs on the top so that that's kind of what you're going to play around with. Oh, that's a good question. So the question was like, so what are our units, right? So that's a very nice question in there. So most often in your CFD softwares and finite element softwares will not prescribe you a unit. So here also, we're not assuming a unit. We want to have, a, we want you to make sure that you have, you're consistent throughout. So if your length is in meters, then you probably want to put your velocity also in meters per second. Right. If your length is in millimeters, then you want to put your velocity also equivalently, or you know, either use millimeters per second or use meters, but then do the right unit conversion. So at the moment, I've not used any units, but we just want to make sure that we are consistent throughout whenever we do it. So if you're using meters in one place, make sure it's meters everywhere. Right. So okay. So what do we do next? So let's say first thing is let's say uh, let's say generate the geometry. Right. So I'm going over the generate the geometry, you know, even though it seems like very mundane, because I want you to be able to go to the website or find any Naka airfoil or any airfoil, take the chord length and thickness, be able to generate your geometry. So from this, you can always export the set of points, put it into SOLIDWORKS, generate your CAD file, be able to generate, run any simulations. Right? So you want to know how to do that. Okay? So first step that we have kind of got, let's say, a set of points on the thickness. Right. So this is just the top half of the airfoil. So now how do we generate the bottom half? Any idea? So if it's symmetric, then I can just put it as minus y. Right. And if, if I assume my center line is at 0, then this will be plus y. If it's symmetric, then it's minus y. But I don't want to necessarily make that assumption. Then I'm going to be restricted to only simulating, let's say, symmetric airfoils. Sorry? Are real aeroflows in real aeroplanes not so symmetric usually? Yeah, they're probably not symmetric, I think. Maybe, right? So maybe we can just plot it and see this one, right? So let's say. Let's see, hopefully it will run. Okay, now it's complaining something. I put a couple of bucks in there for somebody to notice. Let's see. Right, right, yeah. I'm going to give you the score. So whatever we are doing today, you'll have access to that. So you don't have to write it. But then you, you might want to be able to play with different airfoils and see how it compares. Right? That kind of gives you an idea of how, how, what's changing in there, how the 
what does it mean by let's say NACA 23012 or NACA 0014 or something? What does these numbers mean? Uh, right? These numbers have a specific meaning as to why they are a four digit or a five digit. And what these numbers mean, you want to be able to play with it and see how the aerodynamics changes with it. So, for example, there's some, some particular behavior that all the NACA airfoils show. For example, all the NACA four-digit airfoils have a particular type of behavior. All the five-digit have a particular type of behavior. You know, so that's the reason they're classified into one particular class, because each of them have one particular trend in their behavior. And this is something that we want to understand as well, right? So that kind of gives us a, a motivation in a way, right? So first thing is, okay, now we are able to plot that. It looks reasonably symmetric, right? So we assume that it is symmetric and uh, plotted it in there. So that's what I've done. So if you look at it, I've plotted it as, uh, I've just called the function and plotted it as a y, and also plotted the minus y here, right? So essentially I'm plotting the top surface and the bottom surface. Now all you can do is you take these points, create the airfoil, extrude it, that gives you a 3D geometry to work with. Okay. Okay, nice. So what if it's not symmetric, right? Then is there any way to think of this? If it's not symmetric, then we need to think of something. Okay. Yeah. If it's not symmetric, how are you doing some equations that we can use to get it? Okay, okay, there's some equations that you said. Okay, interesting. So P times C. Yes. Okay, what's P? P is. Uh, I know that C is the coordinate. Okay. C is probably the coordinate. X is probably the coordinate. What's P? P is the location of the maximum camber. Okay, so there's another term for us. So we have two terms here. So one was a chord length. Right? So one was a chord length. Then we have the camber. I'm just throwing in terms in there. But then we want to understand what these terms mean as well, in a way, eventually. By the end of the end of our lectures and the labs, we want to understand what these mean. So we are able to effectively at least be able to run, a, run and design a simulation for an airfoil, right? We start with one and then you can always, you know, take your airfoil, throw it out and put any other geometry in there. But at least you want to be a specialist in one of them, okay? So you want to know one very well, okay? Okay, so we probably have some equation that you said. I'm going to put that in there. So we have some equation that says, what should be the y? If it's an unsymmetric airfoil, that means the y is on the top and the y on the bottom will probably be different. And depending on that, I'm going to do some complex mumbo jumbo calculation in there for now. And I'm going to put it in there. So, right, so we'll later worry about that. I'm just going to create another FYC. Okay, so let's see if this is error free. Okay, so right, let's just try to again call this. So you have not defined what's M, you have not defined what's P, you have defined what C is already. So you have said P we don't know, let's say. I thought you said that P is the position maximum yeah, yeah, but then we have not defined that yet on the, our user inputs. So we, what, what's M? Maximum camber, right? So it says here in this comment, if you notice, 100 into m is m, m is the first of the four digits, right? And 10 into p, p is the second digit. So it's kind of like saying like, okay, if you have NACA 
two three zero one two, then that first two and three means something in there. Mm. Very interesting. Probably. Is that so? I don't know. Oh, no, I don't know. I think I messed that up big time. I'm just going to put some number in there for now. Right? So we need to later, as we, by, by the end of it, we need to define these numbers more specifically as to what they are. But at least for now, we are going to try to put some numbers in there, try to understand what they are, and uh, then see, okay, let's, let's see if we'll generate something out of it. Right? And then we can again try to plot this out and see. I'm going to copy a few more things, but okay, no. Okay, that seems to be some error in there. Okay, let's see. Can somebody spot out the error for me here? Okay, so let's leave that there. So what, what would happen if this is unsymmetric? So there are two things that happens once it's unsymmetric. First thing is like we have different y's on both sides. And then we also need to look at the angle of, at each of these points. So because you have a, you have a camber, you have like a, let's say in a profile, we know the y-coordinate, but what's the angle of those y at each of these y-coordinates as well, theta, the slope. And that's something that's what we are calculating with regard to theta. So tan is nothing but, uh, let's say, the y-coordinate and x-coordinate, changing your y-coordinate with regard to changing your x-coordinate, right? So that's essentially like your tan theta. So inverse of that gives you the angle at each of these points. So we are trying to reconstruct our entire airfoil profile. What if it's an unsymmetric thing? So if it was symmetric, it was easy. We get the y's, and then we just take the, let's say, we mirror it along the x-axis, and then we get the minus y's as well, but if it's unsymmetric, then we probably need to do a little more work to get angles of that, angles as well, in order to do that. Okay, so, okay. So we probably want to calculate some of these thetas in there. In the meantime, I'll just leave that in there for you guys to think about what is the fault in this code here? Why is it not working for us, right? It says there's some error in there. Can somebody think of what the error is while I put out the next thing? Anyone? Let's try to plot one of these unsymmetric ones, and then we'll have a, an idea of what I'm talking about. That is probably another error. Or we're still sorting out this one line 10, it says. Yeah. Isn't x an array? Yeah, x is an array. What? Yeah. Then you're going to need to edit this piece so for it to be so elements wise. Mm -hmm. I think we can do that using some kind of a. Oh, yeah. We, we can use a for loop. Okay. Right. So you can use a for loop. Okay. Yes. For counter, for wait. So I is the name of your counter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. You need to make it so 
that you're not doing with x, but you're doing with x that the i. Yes, like this. I repeat that for every single x. Mm -hmm. Every single one. Okay, let's see if that solves our problem. Okay, something seems to be happening. Okay, we still have an error. Okay. Okay. We still seem to have a PC problem somewhere. Line 11. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. We still have a PC problem somewhere else. Okay. 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 Sorry? Mm -hmm. Line 12. Okay. Line 12. Okay. So students solve it. No. Okay, again it says we probably need to do the same thing again, I guess, right? Okay. Let's try to see how to create this air file, right? Okay, still we have an error. Okay, it says we don't know what T is. So what's T? What was our T? T max, right? We don't know what T is. But we are creating a T somewhere here. We need a T. It says maximum thickness. That should be T max then. Okay, so let's try to send that. Still it doesn't know something. It doesn't know sign. Okay, so what are we saying? Why are we sending sign? So we are sending up for upper and minus one for down, right? Why do we need to send that in here? We don't need to call that, but we are getting X, U and XL here. We are sending the up and down there. We are sending some information about the airfoil in there, okay? Let's try to see now finally if it worked. Something happened. Okay, so there are two plotted on each other. Uh, okay, let's do this here. Okay. Okay, this is figure one and figure two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I can plot both of them on the same thing as well. Let, let me do that once and then we can. See? Oops. Okay, so figure one, we have put both the symmetric and the unsymmetric airfoil on one on top of the other, right? And on the figure two, we basically only have the unsymmetric one, which we have plotted. It's hard to see the difference when you put them in two different figures, but now you put the one on top of each other, you can see that there's a huge difference between the airfoil profiles that you're considering in there. So the idea basically wants uh, to create this code was to understand like what do, what do these numbers mean in, when we say when we say NACA and then we put some numbers behind that. Each of these numbers mean something. They mean something, some information about the airfoil and we can take those information to create our own airfoils very easily to run our simulations. Right. I know it sounds, sounds like a very boring, laborious task in there, but somebody could just give you an STL file, but you might want to just try to do that to see how this would change your air, across different air files, right, for somebody who would be interested in doing that. Okay, so now that we have some information about, so for example, here we have got the XU and XA. YU, XL, and YL, which is basically giving us the coordinates on the top surface of the airfoil, XU, as U says, stands for the upper surface, L stands for the lower surface, and gives you the lower surface of the airfoil, okay? 
Now let, let me just suppress one of these things. We don't need to plot them on the same thing anymore. Just to see. Okay. So now we have got the geometry of the airfoil. So what would be our next step? So let's go back to our equation list. So we already used YC, which was basically giving us the Y coordinate of the on the let's say airfoil profile. We know the theta. We have somehow used that in order to get our XU, YU, XL, and YL, right? So this essentially gives us the upper surface and the lower surface of the airfoil, right? I just want to make sure that you understand what the code is, so that you, when you use it, you might want to run it as a black box. Feel free, but you at least want to know what you're running in there. If you get an error, you want to be able to play with it and sort it out by yourself, right? So, so and what these equations mean in regard to that particular code as well, okay? Right. And so our next question is, now we have generated some geometry of the airfoil, so what do we want to do, right? So we, so we have a geometry now. What did we do next in our lab? We took a geometry, and then we tried to do a mesh. So the whole question that we started out with, one, one thing that we started out, so this is, a, this is an interesting part to think about, is our finite L, uh, difference method that we did is going to divide everything into a nice rectangular grid, right? So we said one of the drawbacks of the finite difference method is it's going to take the whole box and chop it into smaller squares. And maybe you have rectangles in there, right? You know, sizes might be different, you might have different rectangles in there. So that's what we talked about last time. So let me just try to draw that as an image so that we kind of remember what we did. We said we have a box, and this is what we are doing in the lab as well. We have an airfoil, and then we have something flowing, right? So there's an inlet, and there's an outlet. Right? Okay, so when we said we are doing finite difference method, we said we are going to divide this into Let's say regular grids. So this is one of the shortcomings of the finite difference method. Is that you cannot have a irregular grid. You have to divide it into regular parts. So now that, that is significantly bad for us because we don't know how to work with the airfoil. Because the airfoil is not a square. If it was a square, then maybe we could fit into one of these rectangles in a way. Right? If our airfoil was something like a square, let's say, let's take a different color here and try to write, write, write out, maybe green, I don't know. Hopefully green you can see. If it was an airfoil was, let's say, a rectangle shape, then I could fit into one of these. But it's not a rectangle shape, it's probably a more complicated shape, so we need to somehow see how we can mesh around that. Okay? So, we need to, we are going to define two different things here. Okay? So let's go back to white. So we are going to say this is our physical domain. And then we are going to define a computational domain. Okay? So I'm going to, let, let me just erase these things out here. Okay? So I'm going to define, okay, that's not an oil. Let's think of this as, hopefully, this is an ellipse. Okay. I'm going to put my airfoil in the middle of it. Okay. And now, I can mesh it nicely. So I can have lines that are going in a crisscross manner. So I'm going to try to put an elliptical domain in there instead of a rectangular domain. Okay? That sounds like, okay, something interesting. But how do we take that? Right? So if I'm going to put an elliptical domain, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically mesh around my airfoil. So this is the idea that we have. So we have an airfoil. Okay? And we want to create our mesh around that. If you're going to lab, this is what your answers flow and somewhat did in a way, right? So you want to somehow let's say create a mesh of this nature. 
So if I think of each of these, each of this somewhat looks like a rectangle. Right? It's not exactly a rectangle, but somewhat looks like a rectangle. So as long as it somewhat looks like a rectangle, I can like somehow use my finite difference method to solve it. That's my idea. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define two domains. One is my com computational domain, and one is my physical domain. So this, is, this should be your, so my mistake. So this should be the physical domain and my computational domain. OK? So I'm going to take my physical domain and computational domain. Physical domain is where the object actually is. And I'm going to map it to a computational domain. OK? I'm going to map it. So if you take any square, if I take any square, I can always map it to an ellipse or a circle. OK? So basically, let's say if these were the four corner points of my square, or presumably the four corner points here, then I can take any point and map it to every other point in here. So I'm basically taking my square, my nice physical domain, and kind of pulling it to make take its shape of an ellipse. The why is this important? Because later, when you go into your coursework, you might want to change the discretization. You might want to say, OK, I want to have more elements, because I want to do a mesh convergence. Right? So I want to understand uh, the whole goal here is to see how do we generate this mesh, because our finite difference is limited by, by, by squares. We can't really do any complex meshes with that. So how do we kind of turn that around so that we are able to work with a more complex object like an airfoil? Because airfoil is not necessarily square. Right? So our whole goal turns out to map, the gridding turns out to map from our, let's say, regular grid to a something that's more circular. So you're mapping between a square and a circle. OK? And that would essentially generate us our new meshes. So I'll stop for here because we are we are running out of time and we'll continue this in the next class. Right? So in the next class we'll try to take this thing and I'll put out the course for you to also look at it. Please do look at it and in the next class we'll try to see how to take this and just solve the problem with our finite difference method. Right? So you'll be able to get the same solutions as your answers at much lower computation cost with MATLAB and be able to play with it and put different airfoils and have a look at them as well. Yeah? Wait, so for the coursework, all we just need to do is use the code you gave us. Yeah. Right. Right. No. Uh, yeah, just, just to again iterate on the, uh, come back to the class with the question. It is the question was like, would we be using the code that I gave you or would you be writing any MATLAB code? You would not be writing any MATLAB code. Like whatever inputs we had so far on the top, that is what you'll be editing, right? So you'll be editing those in order to get the, let's say, run, run your different cases. But apart from that, you might not be doing anything more. Maybe there might be a couple of other variables that will add to the input, which is essentially uh, related to your mesh density that you want to generate. You want to generate meshes of different density to do a convergence analysis, maybe change the element sizes in there in your MATLAB code, but up, which would be a couple of other inputs that would add in there. But apart from that, you yourself will not be writing any MATLAB code. You'll take the MATLAB code, feel free to execute it as a black box, uh, and see what you get out of it. Okay. Thank you very much. And Yeah. So when you do our mesh conversion study, you can use the mesh conversion study with every single angle of attack. Yeah. Good, good question. I would say at least uh, probably want to show it for at least one angle of attack. I think you should be able to get a good solution from there.
So because between 10 and minus 10 is not much difference. So you're, if you are using the relatively the same parameters, you should still be able to get the same good solution. You don't necessarily have to do mesh convergence to reach the angle of attack. I mean, that would be the right way of doing, but then I don't think it's necessary. I think not for the speeds that we are looking at. For example, if you're looking at, let's say, a very, very turbulent flow, then probably that becomes very important when you're really optimizing the airfoil, the shapes, and so on. Yeah. So all I can just do is take my original in the beginning product and I can split it into two into two. I can copy it so that one original, so that my original lab here one is for a mm -hmm. And the other one is for uh yeah. 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 why not? I mean, you don't see even changing the angle of attack is very easy. You just go to the rotation, change the number, and just you update everything else gets updated, including your mesh. You don't really even need to do do much work. No. So, so the whole point is running the simulation itself is not the big thing, but then understanding what you're getting out is the most important. Hey, how are you?